Good afternoon, class, or good morning, or good evening, whenever you're watching this. Today, we're talking about one of the coolest and hardest to figure out how to pronounce this topics in chemistry of the whole year. Um, this week, we're going to spend all week looking at this idea. It's valence shell electron pair repulsion, or I like to call it Vesper. Now, if you're saying to yourself, but that's Vesper. Vis, vis, pr, sure, but we're going to say Vesper because it sounds cooler and uh, it's just better. So, valence shell electron pair repulsion. The question that we're ask, asking and answering is, what's the deal with three-dimensional geometries of atoms? So, if we're going back, if we look, what we've been doing is something like this. We've said, okay, I have a molecule. That molecule is methane. That's stinky. Now, if we look at that, methane is CH4. That has eight valence electrons. We choose our central atom, and then we connect a hydrogen to each of these, and we see, ah, yes, octets. That's nice. We've got our eight, count them, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight electrons. Each of these represents an electron pair. But if we look at this, this is two-dimensional. As two-dimensional, that means that's not how it exists in real life. Now, in fact, valence sh shell electron pair repulsion isn't really how it looks like in real life either. Uh, the real life picture is much more complex. That said, it's a further level of complexity as we look at this and are, are kind of looking forward. Uh, I hope sometime this week to release a video that's going to have uh, kind of like the story of class so far. But briefly, when we think about this, what we've been doing is, is we've been counting. That's been our last kind of two units. So if I have certain numbers of atoms, how many atoms do I have? Then if I have that number of atoms and I react them, what do they do? Well, now we're saying, okay, what are these different collections of atoms and molecules? What do they look like? How are they organized? As opposed to just drawing it as like, okay, this here, there's a block. This here block is C, H, and 4. And we're going to call it good in that. Like, how are these actually orient, oriented? And how are those kind of coming together? So this idea of valence shell electron pair repulsion is really, really, really powerful and really cool to be able to talk through how this is working. Okay, so what's the deal with this? So the deal is valence shell electron pair repulsion. If you can remember that, Vesper, and I'm doing a really bad job taking the video today, valence shell electron pair repulsion. Think of it like this. So our electrons, they always come in pairs, or almost always. We're only talking about the electrons in the valence shell. And since they all have negative charges, they repel each other. So electrons will repel each other and move as far apart as possible. Okay, so what, what does that mean? Well, let, let's look at this. Let's say, now the, the book uses a, an example that's actually, uh, it's, what's it called? An exception to the octet rule when they're looking at the first one. The first one that they're looking at is actually beryllium chloride, BeCl2. And beryllium can be satisfied with four electrons. Now, you're saying to yourself, Mr. Jacobs, what was the point in learning all of those octet rules if there are so many exceptions. I don't know, that's life. 
There are tons of exceptions, and the lab that you guys are going to do is going to look at a lot of those exceptions. Um, beryllium, boron, phosphorus, and sulfur are going to be the ones that are going to most commonly have an exception to the octet rule. But if we look at this, this beryllium has got two things connected to it. These bonds are made of electrons. So if we think about the three-dimensional shape of this, the three-dimensional shape of this, we are going to look at something and uh, say, okay, well, those electrons both have a negative charge. That means in three-dimensional shape, these are going to repel each other. So if I'm going to go ahead and pull up your lab, and this is something that you'll see within your lab. Let's switch it over. So if we look at this, this is a copy of your lab that you guys are going to be doing. This is the program. Um, you're going to Google P-H-E-T Vesper, V-S-E-P-R. And what it does is it builds a three-dimensional model. So what I've created here is a three-dimensional model of beryllium trichloride. And if I look at this, electrons and electrons, whoa! When I bring them close to each other, as long as they're left to their own devices, these are not fixed in any location around the atom. But they will always repel so that they are 180 degrees away from each other. This shape is called a linear shape. Why? Because the molecule forms a line. So what's happening here? As I'm bringing this bond closer, to the other bond, the electrons inside there, the pair of electrons in the valence shell are pushing apart that atom. And no matter what view we look at it, it's always gonna be a line. Kind of fun. Okay, so if we look at that, so if we jump back here, if we have just two pairs here, we get this shape. That shape is called the linear shape. Now, linear is not the only shape that molecules can get. So, linear, beryllium, trichloride. We have a split between these atoms here, and they're separated. Um, another one, something that we could have is something called bent. So, in bent, um, and our bond angle here in linear, sorry, is 180 degrees. When we have a bent molecule, what's happening is, is we have an oxygen with our two hydrogens. I'm just going to add these in here. But oxygen is not an exception to the rule. Oxygen has a complete octet. So let's go ahead and take a look at that on the simulation. If we look at that, we would see, okay, so oxygen, H2O, well, r right here, it's got two lone pairs. Isn't that kind of fun? That's why this program is awesome. If we look now, the two lone pairs are also going to push apart away from each other, and they're going to move everything as far apart from each other as they can. Now, as we look at this, you'll see no matter what situation I put this in, I can always have this as a bent molecule with two lone pairs that are there. So it's not just the bonds that are repelling each other, it's the valence shell electrons. That includes the other electrons within the octet. And they're gonna go ahead and, and push apart from each other as best they can. All right, now here's the shape that you are not familiar with. If I have four connections to something, I get this awesome shape here. This shape is called a tetrahedron or a tetrahedral. Now, uh, I can also do this if I wanted to with bonds. So if we were to go back to our methane that we had before, that was CH4. And if we look at CH4, what we're gonna do is, the furthest apart in three-dimensional space four things can get from each other is actually like this. So this is CH4, and we've got our, our hydrogens kind of coming out and we're all moving at a different angle here. This is called a tetrahedral shape. 
a tetrahedral shape. And let's go ahead and jump back over to our um, sheet so we can talk about what a tetrahedron looks like and how do we draw that since we're not doing this within a, a program all the time. So a tetrahedral shape, what I have is if I've got CH4, the way that we'll write that is we'll have our central carbon here. And then anything that's in the plane of the paper, we're just going to draw like we would normally. So CH4, we've got two of them that can fit in the plane of the paper. And then our other ones, we're going to have one that's like shooting out towards us. So the way we show that is we actually draw this outwards, kind of coming towards me. And I put the H here. So that's like it's popping out. It's sort of like the bond is moving towards you from a perspective. And then we do the opposite, but with a dotted line. And that's saying it's going into the page there. Now our bond angle for this is going to be 109.5. That's as far apart something can easily get to move away from that. Now, one of the things that you're going to see is we're going to have, all right, so this is one that doesn't break the octet. And this is actually also a nonpolar bond because each thing is pulling equally well. On your lab, you're going to see some things will move away from that shape. That's because the electrons will be pulled towards atoms that are a little bit more electronegative, and that will change the bond angles of these different pieces. Now, if you're saying to yourself, okay, who cares about this? What's the deal with this? So literally every single biological interaction has to do with the shape in three dimensions that that molecule can take and make. So everything, when you think about like, all right, why am I me? Oh yeah, that's right. I've got half of my mom's DNA, half of my dad's DNA. Well, that DNA codes for RNA, which then codes for proteins. Those proteins take their shape and that's what make them work. <laughs> so really like, if we're looking at this, this is the foundation for not all, only all of like a good chunk of chemistry. This is also a foundation for why biology works the way that it does. Okay, now one thing that's kind of awesome about this, if we go back here to our bent molecule, our bent molecule is actually a tetrahedron. You ready for this? You kind of saw this because these electrons here even though we don't see them in the way their bond is, it's kind of like Mickey Mouse electrons, those are also going to form that three-dimensional tetrahedral shape. Same with my next one, the trigonal pyramid. So that's three things forming a pyramid. And our example for trigonal period pyramid is going to be NH3, which is ammonia. Now, if we look at ammonia, and we go ahead and pull it up in the simulation, or something like ammonia, what we're doing is, is we're getting rid of one of these, but we still have our octet. So what we have is, we have one, two, three pieces connected to our central atom. Those three pieces connected to the central atom and a lone pair. And that lone pair still pushes apart and repels those bonds. Because remember, the lone pair is two electrons. And the bonds are also two electrons, which is kind of awesome. So when we look at this, ammonia then, if we were to draw this on our paper, well, what we're going to do is we're going to say, all right, well, let's take this and we're going to put two of these in the plane of the paper. Hmm. Let's see, I'm having a hard time finagling this. Let's do it like that. Yeah. Yeah, something like that. Now, the way that we're going to set this up then on our paper, if we were going to draw this trigonal pyramidal pyramid molecule, what we're looking at here is we've got, okay, N, H, H, and then I'm going to make sure I include that lone pair because that's part of what's pushing those other ones away. And then I'm going to add another one in the background like that's going into the page there for my trigonal pyramid shape. So why is this called trigonal pyramidal? 
or trigonal pyramid, we've got one, two, three things. So that's our pyramid with the, the top there. Um, so trigonal pyramid. Well, why, why do we sing that? Well, because there's also trigonal planar. Um, you read this in your textbook. You remember that boron is a weirdo and uh, it is good with six electrons. So BF3 or boron trifluoride looks like this where we have B F F F and it's separated completely uh, into three things and it's satisfied in that shape. Now if we only have three things connected in our valence shell electrons, so we ditch our lone pair, you see that what happens here is we get something that's still in the same plane. So in order for these to repel each other, really, it's like they hate each other. So imagine, uh, I don't know, middle school pseudo romance where you guys are all pretending like you don't like members of the other sex. So you get as far away from them as you possibly could. Um, it's sort of like that. So it's like you bring it close together and then like they just run as far away as possible. That's what's happening. That's why we have all of the shapes that we do have for each of these parts. Well, I look at this then, I see that we have the most stable configuration where they are getting as far away from each other as possible. The valence shell electrons are repulsing as much as they can, is all in the same plane and we are 180, excuse me, 120 degrees from each other. All, so trigonal planar, it's just like that. We're, we've got all three things going through the same part here. So this valence shell electron pair repulsion is really, really cool. So if we look at this, the steps that we have that we're gonna take here when we're working with this, First thing you're going to do is you're going to ask yourself, all right, what's the Lewis structure? So when I have to figure out what's the 3D shape here, and you're going to have a little bit more practice with this as you play through your online lab. But um, I'm pulling these steps from page 342. So if I'm going too fast, you can go ahead and use that as a reference. So first thing you're going to do is draw the Lewis structure. That second step is to count the electron and arrange them in a way to minimize repulsion. So think about how to minimize repulsion. I don't know. I feel like there's some joke I can make there. I'm not, I'm not sure what. Um, and then determine <clears throat> the positions of the atoms from the way the electrons are shared. And then determine the name of the molecular structure from the position of the atoms. So place your atoms. And then name structure. So let's say, for example, we had H2O. Now you're saying, I, I know that already, Mr. Jacob, it's bent, but let's go ahead and go through it. So first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna draw the Lewis structure. This is how we would be drawing it. Now, if we were to think about how we're gonna minimize repulsion, we have four electron pairs around our central atom. Those four, in order for them to get as far away from each other as possible, they are going to need to form a tetrahedral structure. So that means that we are need, going to need to have our oxygen here, our hydrogens coming this way and this way, and then lone pairs are gonna be at kind of a tilt, one coming out and one going in. Now there's no notation for lone pairs, like coming outwards or inwards. So don't worry about that like there is for bonds. And then if we look at this, we say, all right, the shape of this molecule is bent. Now, why is it not tetrahedral? The shape of the electrons are tetrahedral, 
but the molecule itself is bent. So we're just looking at where are the atoms uh, within that structure. If we're looking at this, so here are the list here. You can see this in your textbook on page 345 of all the different names. If we just have a single atom of what are the different bond angles for those pieces. Now, this gets a little bit more interesting once we add in double bonds, uh, but the process is still the same. So uh, <clears throat> for your lab, what you're gonna be doing is you guys are going to be taking a look at a number of different first models, just like I had shown up there, of A, B, C, D, you know, if I have X number of connections to something, how is that going to affect those pieces? Um, I'm gonna go ahead and just take a minute to kind of walk through part of that lab with you. So I know this video is long, so if you need to pause and come back to it, pause it here, because uh, what you're working on the rest of the week, you're gonna finish up your quiz from last week, and then you're going to have your lab that you're kind of stepping through. So if we look at this, what you're gonna be doing is A is gonna be the central atom, you can't remove that, B is a single bonded, C is a double bonded, D is a triple bonded atom, E is electron pairs, so those are your lone pairs that are not bonded. <clears throat> How this lab is gonna work, what you're gonna do is you're gonna draw your molecule to the best of your ability. Doesn't need to be beautiful, you do have to do it though. Then write in, so make sure you're clicking on the molecular geometry, Labeling in your picture the bond angle, that's something students often forget. Make sure you're still doing that. And then looking at the central atom, is the octet satisfied? Now within this lab, you are gonna look at a couple things that where we're gonna have satisfied octets and some that are exceptions to the rule. So like any rule, there are exceptions to it. So if we're to do this first one here, AC2, A, central atom cannot be removed, C2, double bonded white atom. So if I go and I pull up my lab here, what that's gonna look like is it's gonna be A, C2. Make sure that you've got molecular geometry clicked, electron geometry clicked, and to show all bond angles that that's clicked. I'm using the HTML5 version, which I highly recommend that's the one that you use. Um, there's an older version of this that might have a harder time running on your computer. Now, if I look at this, so this is what I would be drawing then in here in my lab. So if I hop back over to the lab, see, oh, okay, I've got 180 degrees. This is what it looks like. What, what you're gonna be doing is, is you're gonna be drawing that right here. Doop, doop. You're gonna put in the molecular geometry, in this case, linear. And then is the octet satisfied? Yes or no? So in this case, we'd go, yes, it is. Our central atom has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight is an octet. You'll also need to make sure that you're labeling that 180 degree angle that is there. You're like, oh man, okay. That seems like kind of a lot. No, it's gonna take you like, about a minute per thing as you're kind of moving through these different parts. Okay, so if we look at this then, for each of these, for the first set, that's what you're gonna be doing. After you finish that, you're gonna take a look at all of those and then we're gonna jump over to the real molecules. So you're gonna take the generic formula, which of these up here represented H2O. And then what were the bond angles from it? And then what are the true bond angles? So you're gonna be comparing, okay, this is if everything is just generic. There's no real atoms that are here. This is what it is in real life. The difference is gonna be that we have some electronegativity differences in our new molecules. So you're gonna compare each of those pieces. Once you've done that, what we're gonna do is we're still gonna have in the real molecules tab, drawing each molecule, naming the geometry for the ones that break the octet. So you're gonna go ahead and do the same thing for ones that break the octet. Let's just make sure that everybody can see, okay, how do we do real molecules? So if you go on the bottom here, you can click real molecules. 
And there's a pull down menu that's going to let you see, all right, hey, let's look at all these different pieces. So that first one, the real molecule is CO2 and it has the exact same geometry as our, our generic model did. This is one carbon with two oxygens connected to it. The octet is satisfied and we're good to go. Some of the others, you might see a difference there. Now of these examples here, a couple of these are wacky and wild. So if we look here, whoa, that is awesome. And you're going to have to be able to see, okay, which are the things that are going to give me exceptions to the octet rule? How is that happening? What's the difference there? So for each of those exceptions, you're also going to need to draw in your atoms for those pieces. And then this right here is just some questions to answer. So if you want to type these up, you may. Make sure you're answering them in complete sentences and completely. So uh, hopefully you know what this is at this point. What does Vesper, Vesper stand for? And then kind of answering the different pieces for this. If you need uh, help with these, go ahead and first reach out to a classmate, set up a Zoom call, and uh, kind of talk through what you think is going on there. If you guys both are still stuck, uh, go ahead and send me a message and we can kind of set up a Zoom call for those questions. So this whole thing, this is what we're doing this week. So this is how many days of content? Lots of days of stuff to do. So go ahead, get started on this. This is four days worth of material to kind of take your time as you go through that. Um, you guys have a wonderful week and Hopefully we will talk soon. Thanks guys.